Today's episode is brought to you in partnership with the AM Consumer and Retail Group, Avalara, Miracle, Williot, and Sezzle. Ranked in the top 10% of all podcasts globally and currently ranked the number one podcast in all of retail by Feedspot, the Retail Fast Five is the podcast that we hope makes you feel a little smarter, but most importantly, a little happier each week too. And the Fast Five is just one of the many great podcasts that you can find from Amitalk Retail alongside our Retail Daily Minute, which brings you a curated selection of the most important retail headlines each morning and our Retail Technology Spotlight series, which goes deep each week on the latest retail technology trends. Today is May 22nd, 2024. I'm one of your hosts, Sam Mazinga. And I'm one of your other hosts, Chris Walton. And we are here once again to discuss and debate the most important headlines from the past week. And today, Chris, we are yes. joined for the regular, month, regular monthly appearance by the- Some Alvarez would say. And, and, <laughs> yes, by the Alvarez and Marcel <laughs> Consumer and Retail Groups, Truett Horn, and Jeremy Levine. Welcome to the show. Jeremy, this is your first time. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Yes, yeah, psyched, uh, psyched to be here. And what was the prep like for this first podcast? I want to hear all about it. Did you watch previous shows? Did Truett give you any tips? What happened? I, I'm already a regular listener, so didn't need to go back and do any homework there. Uh, oh, so I've met it. just... Uh, brushed up on a couple of these headlines. Some of them are kind of new. Um, that's about it. So I'm looking forward to chatting. Nice. They just threw you in the deep end of the pool and expect you to survive. Is that it, Jeremy? Is that how this is working today? That, that, that's how it works here. So I'm <laughs> ready to rock, though. <laughs> well, Sounds like a true consultant's assignment, if I may say so myself. Yeah, that, that is correct. That is correct. Um, <laughs> well, Jeremy, for those who have not met you since it's your first time, maybe give us a quick background on um, you. Sure. So Jeremy Levine, uh, Senior Director in a ms Consumer and Retail Group, uh, based in New York. I've been a consultant for over 10 years. Uh, my clients are primarily in fast-moving retail sectors. So think uh, grocery and convenience in particular. Cool. Uh, I spend most, yeah, spend most of my time running large-scale transformations, uh, focus on improving operations and reducing costs. Uh, I also spent a few years overseeing operations for companies in the food delivery and technology space before joining a &M, So I've been on the operator side as well. Um, I know we're talking about food today and I love to cook. So yep. excited to chat and uh, feeling a little smarter and a little happier already. All wow. Right. And we got the per perfect person here for today's headlines. There's a lot Absolutely. of that in today's headlines. We just got the luck of the draw on this one. This yeah. Is Absolutely. Uh, Truett, welcome back, friend. Um, tell you. tell the audience a little bit about you if if they haven't caught an episode where you've been one of our Fast Five guests. Great. Well, thanks so much for having me again, Anna and Chris. Great to be back. Always one of the highlights of my my year whenever I can join you. So, um, so Truett Horn, I'm a partner with our consumer and retail group. Uh, do pretty similar work to Jeremy in terms of uh, large scale change and transformation a bit more on the uh, growth side. Um, so do have a marketing background. And um, and so, you know, a lot of the work I do is, uh, you know, kind of driving top line growth for our clients in the consumer retail industry. I'm out of Dallas and um, I uh, really enjoy um, this podcast. So excited to be back. Thanks for having me again. Awesome. Is it, what, what, uh, what episode is this for you, Truett? I think this is three. Three. Okay. Um, and I'm, you know, I guess I didn't do too bad the first time, the first two times, but I'll keep working on it. So, so you have me back again. Three, I think is the endorsement. I think that's the endorsement level, right? And I think that's, I think that's sure. when, I think then that's when we're like, okay, we're, we're pretty good. True. It, true. It can come yeah. back anytime he wants. Right. I feel pride. Uh, you know, some pride with that. So <laughs> I'm glad I well passed said. the test. Oh, all right. Well, you guys, let's get to the headlines for today. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say on these. So Chris, I'll hand it over to you. All right, Ann. Well, today we've got news on Walmart's neighborhood market push, GoPuff price matching Aldi in the UK, Lego linking employee compensation to its carbon reduction efforts, and Hims and Hers debuting $199 per month weight loss shots. But we begin today with what sounds on the surface like aggressive pricing moves from Target. And yes, absolutely. Um, just before their earnings this morning, Chris, Target said earlier this week that it plans to cut 
prices on over 5,000 items. According to Retail Dive, Target plans to cut prices on 5,000 popular items across its assortment and has already reduced the prices of 1,500 items with more reductions planned to continue throughout the summer. The price cuts will be centered on non-discretionary grocery, household, and health and beauty items. Um, Jeremy, first timer, we're going to go to you first on this one. We have to ask you, would you have advised Target to make this move? And more importantly, what do you think it signals? Yeah, so obviously a a doozy of a headline. Um, And I would say that they they have to do it. I mean, we are in an inflationary environment. Retailers everywhere are dropping prices. They're seeing increased competition from Walmart and Aldi and others. Mm -hmm. Uh, They need to protect market share and they need to make sure their customers don't get in the habit of of shopping elsewhere. Um, Also, just looking at A&M's most recent consumer sentiment survey, uh, we saw that the biggest decline in willingness to spend was actually in the higher income households. This is really starting to hit their core customer. and obviously with the news today, their, their their stock is down. So I think they need to take action. Mm-hmm. Um, so to me, the signals that price competitiveness on food and household essentials is table stakes right now, uh, even for the more affluent customers that, that they serve. Um, I'll say two things about this on the positive side. I think mm-hmm. they were at least coming from a position of strength, maybe less so after uh, kind of the stock performance today, but they do have $2 billion more of operating income from last year than they did the year before, and they had a great Q4, so they were in a good place to, uh, are in a good place to invest in pricing. Um, but I look at this announcement, I look at the recent launch of their value-driven, deal-worthy brand, mm-hmm. and both moves are built to compete on price. And I think that makes sense, given where the uh, economy is. Uh, but at the same time, they can't just be about price. They still need to be Target and deliver that elevated experience uh, where it makes sense. So sure, drive traffic and loyalty with competitiveness on on these sort of items, bring people yep. in the door. Um, but they still need to differentiate an assortment experience in other areas, you know, those higher end, more style driven, kind of off the impulse items and categories. Uh, otherwise, it's, uh, it's just a race to the bottom. Yeah, we're seeing, you're so right, Jeremy. Like, I mean, the amount of discounts and promotion of those discounts from McDonald's to Aldi, to Wendy's. I mean, everybody is marking stuff down, uh, especially for this summer, um, at least, or this temporary time period. Chris, you were, you were yeah. nodding along. What I'm are chopping at the bit on this yeah, one. Yeah, I know. I can imagine. <laughs> what do you I have mean, to say? I mean, the other part of this question too, or this headline is, will it matter? Will it even make a difference? And, and I would actually resolutely say no. Um, really? And yeah, I actually think this is a nothing a- announcement. This is like one of the biggest nothing announcements I've seen in a while. It's pure PR window dressing. And it goes back to the whole honesty is not synonymous with truth and which is a hmm. continuing motif on this show. Okay. And the reason I say that is all of wa- all of Target's key items in the grocery essentials, whatever categories, household uh, categories that they're doing this in, they're all comp shopped against Walmart already. And so what's likely happening here is Target is just taking early credit for pricing action that they know they're going to do. And the tell for that in in the story for me is that they've done it on 1,500 items already, but the rest of the items are going to come during the course of the summer. If you're going to be aggressive, just do it. Like, why would you wait? So like that tells me that they're just trying to get PR credit and trying to position themselves in the media as being a low-priced alternative that people can shop. But at the end of the day, it's not going to move the needle because people still have this perception of Target and that perception of Target is quite warranted as well because of the Target brand that it has. And so it's a slippery slope to go too far into this, which is why I think they're just taking credit for the price reductions that they already have planned or that they consistently do year over year. Target did this too when I was there back in 2008, 2009. That's the last time I remember them doing this during the housing crisis. Similar thing. And the approach was very similar back then too. So so I... I think this is a big nothing. I, I I don't think it'll move the needle at all. And it just goes back to the point again, Target has a growth problem. Let's just say that very overtly right here on this podcast. They need to find growth. And again, I mean, we said too, like, wasn't it two weeks ago, Ann, where we, where we were talking about the, the wholesale brands? Like we thought mm-hmm. that was something they were trying to do to gin up the media on their growth, which who knows how much is there, but in advance of what was likely a poor earnings call as it turned out to be this morning. So would you be advising against this move? No, no. I think okay. it's fine. I'd be doing yeah. it. I'd be yeah. doing it, but it's not 
it's again, it's like kind of similar thing, like with the whole wholesaling strategy, like, yeah, it's cool. It sounds good, but really you're not going to get that much from these efforts. You got to figure out something new. And Walmart is kicking their butt when it comes to developing honest to God, billion dollar growth strategies. Well, I think there's two separate Rant things over, here. I guess. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think your your points alone on growth strategy and whether or not this was a good move, I think are are not cannot be like right. linked inextricably. I think like there is still I would advise towards this move. You had to like Jeremy was saying, you had to do something when Walmart, yeah. when Aldi, already a discounted grocer, are coming out saying that they're going to slash prices on, you know, twenty percent of their SKUs this yep. summer, like if if Target wants to remain this one-stop shop that they yep. will, that people are going for for the Target, like you do have to put something out there in the media that draws customers in the door. So I I I think like. I, I don't know. I think Target did a good job on this. Like, yes, PR moves, you should be taking advantage yeah. of this. What's wrong with that? Like you, if, if that's what gets people in the door, that's what gets people in the door. So I, I think like I would have, I would definitely would advise towards doing this if I was Target. And I think it's, it's going to be interesting to see like where these prices remain when we get to the end of the summer like is this adjustment from inflationary pricing and they're just dropping the prices for the summer and then what happens you know when when all these summer pricing comes to an end what will, will target summer pricing come to an end like where does all of this net out and what does that mean for the shopper but true it we're going to go to you for the last word uh, I think it's well captured the only kind of punctuation I think I've put on this is that ultimately all of this pricing action is good for consumers and, mm -hmm. you know, recent Fed yeah. con uh, consumer sentiment, uh, everyone's feeling the pinch in particular parents are feeling the pinch. And so it is, you know, it's creating financial stress, although consumers are still spending. Um, there is a, just a concern on the economy in terms of how long this continue can continue. So I think the fact that uh, you are seeing some, you know, deflation in certain key items, is a, I think, a healthy thing for consumers. And um, I think, you know, at some point, the the inflation that we've seen the past four years had to reset, and hopefully we're seeing a little bit of that at this point. Excellent. Lo way, to, yeah. way to tie it all in a bow, Truett. I love it. Yeah. I mean, the other thing about this too, Ann, real quick, is like Walmart always leads on price, you know? And so, and and that that's generally the position Target's going to take. And if Target doesn't do that and starts being more aggressive than Walmart on price, then whoa, we got a real big story here. And I'm 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 dubious that that's what they're doing here. So, all right, headline number two: Walmart is planning to go bigger with new neighborhood markets, according to Grocery Dive. Walmart is growing its neighborhood market format with a newly opened store in Santa Rosa Beach, Florida, and another slated to open soon in Atlanta. Both omni-channel focused locations are larger than previous neighborhood markets, spanning around 57,000 square feet of sales floor and pickup and delivery space. According to Walmart's SVP of neighborhood market, an uptick in e-commerce sales for Walmart was a primary factor in the company's decision to increase the square footage of these new stores. And the two new locations kick off Walmart's growth initiative of opening 150 locations over the next five years, including neighborhood market stores and additional super centers. Truett, it's your turn. Do you think this move is an overt defensive one against Amazon, a smart omni-channel play, or am I reading too much into it? Or is it a little bit of both? What, what's your take here? Um, look, I, I don't think this is um, a huge pivot in strategy or something that'll you know drive the next S curve for Walmart, but I do think it's it's a continuation of what they are strong at, um, and and building on their strengths, and and in fact, you know, kind of testing, learning, trying new formats, seeing what works, but built on on their strength. Um, and and uh, there's really kind of three things I would think about that. One is grocery. Um, so obviously they have been taking a lot of share in grocery. I think they were up mid single digits um, this last quarter in terms of uh, the grocery space. And that is, that's an area that they want to continue to, to grab share. The second is e-commerce and particularly click and collect. Um, I think they are over 25% of, of the click and collect business, um, you know, across categories. And that is some, some strength that they have with their formats that they can continue to flex. 
And then third is um, the services side of thing. And I think with these neighborhood markets, they're continuing to, you know, explore and bring in pharmacy and other kind of services, um, you know, to kind of round out the the offering. Um, and and it's just it they're driving all of that. They're I mean, defense against Amazon. Not not sure if that's exactly the intent here, um, mm. but I think it's building on them being a you know arguably the best omni-channel retailer that there is and continuing to flex that that strength across every format that they have. Um, I think it's smart um, and it's another kind of way for them to to quickly test something and and learn from it. I also thought it was interesting just in terms of locations for for these um, these test you know formats because they have been driving more penetration as well noted with higher income levels mm-hmm. and um, and you know that could intersect in terms of trying to capture share, you know, with that demographic as well. So uh, overall, I think it's a it's a good move and and um, more of 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 kind of what what they've you know, their strategy, which is very clear. That's a great point, especially with Walmart Plus as well, you know, being a factor in this. Yeah, the first neighborhood market I ever went into was in Boulder, Colorado. Now that now that I think about it. So and what do you think about what you just said? Look, I just have a few quick points on this one. The more nodes in the huh. network, the better. Right. Nodes are extra, always good. Ed. Yes. 15,000 square foot of extra back of house, assumably back of house space that will allow for more room as Walmart. It allows them to flex up or down, determine what these nodes are most needed for. Like true, it said, push hard in grocery. And, you know, we just supply chain dive just reported this week yesterday that yep. actually Walmart is the go- not only the go-to for grocery, but they are continuing to beat Amazon in same day or next day delivery. So I think this is a could be a key component to them really being able to just blow Amazon out of the water. Yeah, yeah. All right. Nice. Nicely said, Anne. I, strong opinion there. All right, Jeremy, what do you think? Do you agree with these guys? Are we going to be resolute in our consensus on this one? Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think I'm uh, I think I'm on, on the same page here. They're definitely leading to their strength. Um, I mean, their, their key strength against Amazon is having their stores is a great way to to double down on that. Uh, I think the this additional point that I would add here, uh, I just I really like this from a, a fresh lens. So oh, I think a, a portion of the space is going to be allocated towards having a a wider, fresh assortment. Yeah, uh, we know that's great to drive traffic, to drive loyalty. So I think I just I like the move from from that side as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I it's crazy. We all agree on this one, one hundred percent. I think it's a, it's a great omni-channel move. And true it to your question about, or to the point you made about, is it a defensive move again against Amazon? It's kind of like yes and. It's a great omni-channel move in general, given the business model. And by the way, it probably makes it difficult, more difficult for Amazon to get their fresh concept off the ground, which they've clearly struggled with. The only question I have for it really is. What's going on in that back room? Like, is alert yeah. innovation part of this at all? That wasn't alluded to in terms of how they're designing that back room. If anyone knows about that, I'd be curious about that. Alert innovation, of course, the company, the micro fulfillment robotics company they acquired a few years ago that can work in smaller spaces too. So I'm curious to see where this goes uh, with that angle in the long run too, Ann. All right. Well, let's go to headline number three. Uh, GoPuff has expanded its 24-7 grocery delivery service in the UK while also promising to price match Aldi. According to internet retailing instant grocery delivery company, GoPuff has launched a new 24-7 service for customers in Birmingham, Bristol, Cardiff, Leeds, Manchester, and Swansea following a surge in demand for late night orders in these areas. The extended delivery service has been introduced in tandem with the platform's Aldi price match promise across these locations with both launches aimed at providing more value and convenience to customers. Price matching over 50 products, customers will be able to purchase kitchen staples like pasta and rice to fresh fruits, vegetables, meat, and dairy at Aldi prices delivered to their door in minutes. Jeremy, I cannot believe I'm actually reading this. Is this sustainable? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so 24 seven late night delivery, uh, speedy delivery and matching the prices of all these in-store products. I mean, I, I'm, I can barely talk. I'm in disbelief. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? Yeah. It was hard to, to read that one with the straight face. I mean, honestly, I think my first question before getting to the headline is like, what is happening in these five places? There's a surge in late night demand for snacks. Like, why there are, are universities ice cream at 4 right here, right? All of a sudden. 
I think there's a lot of universities in some of, or at least universities yeah. in this area. That's, go, Puffs, that's... go Puffs demo. Yeah, right, yeah. right. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Either way, I think there is no chance that this is sustainable. This feels okay. like a, a splashy marketing play to me. Um, first, just for perspective, we were talking about 50 items. That is, what, 2 or 3% of Aldi's assortment. So relative to Aldi, that it's not not a lot. Um and just to say, they have no chance of competing with Aldi on price because um, they are just structurally a different company. I mean, this is this is apples and oranges, right? Aldi is built top to bottom to deliver value, you know, from their private label to their right. limited assortment and so on. GoPuff hand delivers every order and is built to compete on convenience. Um, I should add, just looking at Aldi, I know they have a extremely aggressive. Uh, history of competitive responses to price challenges. So I, I just don't think that this is a place that, that yeah. GoPuff would, would want to play uh, for any period of time. Um, all that to say, as I mentioned before, I think this is a, a splashy kind of marketing play. Um, I know Gettier just left the UK market. So my yep. guess is that this is a play to grab the attention of those customers while they still can, mm -hmm. you know, while right. they're Share in the habit of, of making these sorts of purchases. Um if not, between the 24-7 and the Aldi price matching, I think this is probably, you know, if they're not doing that, this is a great way to uh, to light some money on fire. So uh, yes. I, hope it's a, I hope it's a marketing play. I So you feel the way that Chris felt about the first story, it sounds like, with Target. But I, I mean, I just, I don't understand. You have a c consumer who is willing, like, for convenience to pay more money. Like, they're they're still going to do it. They know they have to pay more. You're not going to mark up the, like, it just, I don't, I don't understand how it pencils. Um, Truett, where do you land on this one? Well, it makes me think of one of my wife's favorite phrases that she shares with me, which is play stupid games, win stupid prizes. <laughs> and right. so I think it's, you know, it's kind of be careful what, what, you know, what you uh, are, are wish for here. Um, and I, yeah, it's stated, I don't think um, they're going to win on price. And uh, it's really about the service they provide. So I think just kind of staying focused on your value prop and core competencies and not straying too far from that, I think is is typically the right strategy. Oh, I like that. Play stupid games, win stupid prizes. Your wife sounds like a brilliant woman. Um, Chris, close us out. I mean, uh, what, always, hap what always happens here? The host gets, gets kudos to the, to the guest wife too. And that's a smart, smart play there. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's no, a great it, sentiment. I think it's, yeah, she I'm, I'm stealing it. that for sure. Yeah, yeah. It's a great, it's a great analogy too. Like go puff is the carny trying to sell us all a big stuffed elephant in a lot of ways. Um, <laughs> I mean, the point I would make on this as I was thinking about it yesterday in preparation for today is I was kind of thinking about, okay, what are the implications of this? If you try to extrapolate go puff and its position here in the U S market and I think the story gets really interesting there because this is a rub of the ultra fast delivery model. You know, you're when you think about it, at the end of the day, you're competing against minimally going to the store or click and collect. So you're going to have to meet those prices in the long run for this idea to be successful, um, which again shows you there's probably likely a cap on speed when you talk about the implications in the US market. And so honestly, when I look at what Walmart Plus is doing with its latest extensions with overnight and early morning delivery, it feels like if I get right down to it and I'm very candid, it feels like GoPuff is already lost. Like they've lost the battle before it's even really gotten going. And so the model overall, however, is potentially sustainable, but you need regular subscription revenue or you need the full omni-channel play like Walmart has to meter out the impacts so that you can look at it more from a long-term value of the customer standpoint and the, the overall omni-channel relationship you have with your customer. So that's the that's what I'm taking away from this story. It seems, I agree with Jeremy, it seems like a desperate marketing move, but it does make me question the long-term viability of GoPuff, particularly here in the United States, when you look at all the factors at play. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they are, they're in the high, a high density area in the UK right now. Like this doesn't get better when you get to the U S either. So somebody, somebody will explain to me, I'm sure in the comments, why some VC will explain why we're wrong. Yeah. Yes, some VC exactly. will explain why we're wrong. All exactly. right. Headline number four, Lego is now thinking it's employee is now linking, not thinking. Well, they have thought about it and, but they're also linking their employee compensation to their decarbonization efforts. According to ESG Dive, who knew that even existed until this week? There's an ESG Dive, and 
The Lego Group will tie part of its salaried employees' bonuses to its annual carbon footprint beginning this year. While the performance metric is primarily based on direct emissions, which are scope one and scope two, the company said it aims to expand it over time to include scope three as well. The Danish toy maker unveiled a new key performance indicator to measure emissions generated from its direct operations and business travel, which is also a scope three category, and compare, and compare it to the amount of toy bricks manufactured in the same period. Lego said the comparison allows it to attain a measurable, quote, carbon intensity metric, end quote, that can be tracked over time. Truett, back to you. Question, what do you think of Lego's decision here? And more importantly, how would you advise other retailers to put similar teeth behind their own ESG efforts? So Hardest question of the very, day. Very interesting question, and I'm honestly very mixed on it. Um, Are you? I, I, uh, you know, there's a very cynical side that I, you know, of me that basically says, okay, this is n not a uh, PR ploy, um, but something that, uh, you know, is, is ultimately used to garner attention for their ESG program. Um, I will say on the, the flip side, this is one of, I looked at the Lego values earlier today and it was very interesting, but this is one of the promises in their vision um, is, is planets mm -hmm. and zero carbon emission. Um, at the end of the day, they produce plastic products and plastic is carbon. And so I, I do, um, you know, applaud the efforts in terms of if you are interested in environmental impact, given the nature of your product to do something about it. I think the the concern I have is really, um, you know, the influence that individual employees can have on this corporate program. And is hmm. this the right, the right way to get at um, the mission and vision that they have um, for ESG? And so is it putting it on the backs of their employees um, in terms of compensation? And ultimately, um, you know, do they have sufficient influence to, to do anything about it? Yeah, business travel, they could take one less trip. Is that really going to have the impact considering the, the millions of, of plastic units they're creating every day? And so is there, you know, a better way to deliver a corporate mission um, if, if environment is important that, um, you know, that is, is more um, you know top down or or is clearer in terms of um, you know kind of driving it from from leaders in the organization versus you know kind of the front line. So that was my, my overall question. I think in general, uh, it, this comes up all the time in terms of ESG and the values of companies. Uh, you know, just from a talent perspective, hiring you have to have a a mission beyond you know just profit and selling and selling products. I think it's very important for companies to. To, you know, to live by their values, but at the same time, it has to be uh, genuine and authentic and, and you have to live up to your commitments, right? So I appreciate that they are actually living up to their commitments. Most corporations don't, to be honest. Um, I just, I'm not sure this is the, the best way to do it, um, but obviously open to other opinions on it. Wow. Okay. So a little Debbie Downer on this one, Troy. I mean, <laughs> whoa. Wow. Um, okay. So got it. this is going to open up a great discussion. Jeremy, do you agree with your your AM consumer and retail group compatriot here, or do you have any other things that you would add? I think uh, I'm a little I'm a little more optimistic. A little it. more optimistic. Okay, yeah, bring more. it back. Why? Uh, not 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 all the way, but but a little. Okay. Um, so I mean, first of all, I like I applaud any company that's you know serious about being a, a good corporate citizen. They have science based targets. They have measurable goals. I, I love all of that. Um, I think what I would say to be successful for any ESG program is, you know, it, it's it's good that they have this KPI that kind of applies across the business. But, mm -hmm. you know, I think in order to be successful in ESG, you really need to weave it into the fabric of, of how you do everything. Mm -hmm. And I think different functions contribute to ESG in different ways. So they need to have different KPIs. And I think you need to yeah. kind of work with each leader to develop kind of what that is, what the goals are. So um, kind of devil in, in the details and, and how all of this works. Um, I also just say that something that we've, we've talked about for a long time, you know, ESG goals don't need to be contrary to business goals, right? If you have right. a more efficient supply chain, you have better production, you have, uh, you know, lower material packaging, like all of those are good for the bottom line and ESG. So it doesn't necessarily need to be a, a zero sum game. So I would just emphasize that. I 100% agree with that. I think, and that's the point that I liked about this article too, is 
is and that feels like Lego is doing what you just said, and and they're doing it in, in in an idea that I'd never thought about, which is tying my compensation directly to how much I travel as an employee. Like you know, like I got to thinking about it last night. I was like, you know, how many store trips did I need to make as a district manager, or how many you know conference trips did I need to make, or trade show trips did I need to make, and so you know, by by making this your first start in that effort, then it makes it really hard for the comp- employees to complain about travel budgets being decreased. And then you get the the kind of net net win-win for both the environment and the company's income statement from that approach too. And it forces your employees to be smarter about where they're spending their time and the impact that they are potentially having on the environment. So I like that as a first move. And what do you think though? Um, I, yeah, I mean, money talks and if right. you're attaching money to like, of uh, it, this is the best way that I've seen any company incentivize people to actually focus right. on some of those ESG goals. So I, I think you have to give like a lot of credit for that. I do agree with what Jeremy was saying earlier, though, they have to continue to clearly define what employee expectations are to help achieve these goals. It can't just be this lofty, like, don't travel as much or think about it. It's like, start to really like, um, address what people are doing to bring the, the, yeah, or bring sustainability goals into the fore and then encourage other ways for people to be able to do that. I don't think you can just leave it to people to do on their own. And the last thing that I think that this is doing that I think is so important as we start to see more and more people coming into the workforce who are not focused as much on pay, but who are focused on culture, this is a key component of ensuring that you are giving people, even if they're in charge of like plastics manufacturing at Lego, um, that they have a purpose to their job. And the purpose is to be a good corporate citizen, like uh, Jeremy and Truett were saying. That's a great point. Jeremy, what do you, what do you think? You got anything else you want to yeah. add here? Yeah. Just to kind of emphasize the, uh, you know, the challenges of, of continuously measuring these things, right? Cause if it's, if it's too easy of a goal, then it doesn't really change behavior. If it's too difficult of a goal, then you can risk frustrating employees. So it just, you really have to strike a balance and right. kind of how you, how you set the bar for these things. Um, but I think that's that's where you kind of have to try and, and kind of learn over time. And but starting with the commitment is is definitely kind of the the best first step. Yeah, and and you brought up a great point too, which I think you know we 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 cover the headlines every single week. This is the only one I can recall where a company is saying, "Here's how we're going to do this, and yeah. how we can expect the employees to get on board with it." You know, everything right. else is just so amorphous, and it's like, you know carbon reduction goals that are really hard to calculate and you don't really understand how you're how you're even relevant in that conversation as right. your average everyday employee so i think it's a great point that you brought up all right well let's move on to headline number five which i love and i'm so excited <laughs> to have true and jeremy on the show because i want to get your perspective on this headline number five is that hims and hers health inc have debuted a 199 dollar weight loss shot at an 85% discount to Wagovi. According to Bloomberg, Wagovi costs roughly $1,350 a month for injections without insurance. Usually insurance does not cover these. Um, and Eli Lilly's Zepbound is also similarly priced. Obviously, $199 a month is a huge discount. And Hims and Hers can offer this prescription weight loss drug because U.S. regulators have rules which allow pharmacies to make copycat versions of drugs when in a shortage, a practice that's known as compounding. Fun fact, uh, this practice exists to make drugs available when manufacturers can't produce enough to meet demand or when a pharmacist needs to tweak a drug's recipe to remove an ingredient that might cause an allergic reaction in some people. Jeremy, everybody's on the Zempies, right? The miracle drug the craze <laughs> isn't slowing down. I've heard that. a month is a drastic reduction in price. I think we're going to just see people jumping on this bandwagon as soon as humanly possible. How are you and Truett and the team that's at A&M Consumer and Retail Group preparing retailers and brands that you work with for the potential after effects of all of this? Yeah, I got to be honest. Um, I... I don't know where all this is going to land. I would I would yeah. love for this to be a catalyst for folks to you know, live a healthier lifestyle in the long term. Uh, I hope it accelerates some of the trends towards healthier living that that we're already seeing. Um, 
I think it's it's fascinating that he was able to find, you know, I guess I'll call it a loophole. Yeah, right. They, right. Very that they much so. Very much produce. so. Produce. Yeah. yeah. I, I didn't know that existed until this story either. So I think that was that was fascinating. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, my question is, A, how long does that last and until kind of the patent holders actually build out their capacity and, and what does that look like right yep. um <laughs> i'm sure him is happy to cash in as, as as much as they can in the meantime um but yeah no look i, I and he just goes to show that you know they are smartly working through and, and operating in the dynamics of, of their space and other companies can can learn from that and, and make sure they, they do the same is there anything like have have your clients been asking you about this, Jeremy, or like how to approach this consumer who isn't isn't snacking as much, isn't you know isn't consuming enough as much in the grocery department? They're not on the vitamins and prescriptions that they might have been as they continue to lose weight. Like, are you, are your clients digging into these questions with you? Uh, they're not. I actually spent time at a client in California uh, yeah. for lasting you know, on six six months or so. And uh, I think it was particularly prevalent there, and it wasn't even on on their radar quite right. yet. So I just don't think it's it's big enough to kind of reach the the boardroom uh, okay. level conversations quite yet. Interesting. Um, maybe this will be the catalyst to do so. We'll right. see. Right. Certainly going to be uh, when you reduce the price of this drug eighty five percent. True. What about you? Have you had a clients come to you to ask about this? I think it's especially interesting too when you think about like the loophole that Jeremy mentioned. Like someday this is going to close and all the costs are going to go back up to you know thirteen hundred dollars a month. So then, what happens when you have this like fluctuation in in like behaviors of your consumers? True. It. Yeah, I think it's um, it's a really fascinating question. I, I honestly, I feel like this is similar to Gen AI in which everyone is really interested in keeping up with it, but nobody knows the implications of it at this point. And okay. so similar to Jeremy, I think it's an interesting, it's a board level kind of cocktail discussion. It's not a board level topic, right? And, really? and perhaps okay. it should be, uh, particularly if you think about how transformative uh, I mean, Novo Nordis, and we have a, an obsession with Danish companies um, on the podcast today because you have <laughs> right. this one and then, and then Lego. Lego, yeah. Uh, but uh, their market cap is larger than the industrial output of Denmark. And so the potential of this is is transformative. And so I, I think we have to begin understanding the permutations of what this, as you described, can have on snacking, which the past 30 years has been everything has been the snacking trend and does it yeah. put this completely upside down that have a big impact on companies like we talked through with Walmart and Target um, in terms of driving sales, particularly, you know, in grocery. Um, the other piece that I do think, and Jeremy alluded to this, is what I do think is a case study is hims and hers and what they're doing and how innovative <laughs> they have been from a business model perspective, cracking the DCC prescription model. And then to, you know, we always talk about being agile and quick. They saw an opening, mm -hmm. they seized on it. Even if it's a short amount of time, I would imagine the amount of customer acquisition this will drive for them is extremely sure. large, yeah. getting them in the ecosystem. And then if there's other drugs they can leverage with those customers, it's what we preach with our yeah. clients is to seek opportunities, find a way to go attack it. If this was a much larger pharma company and probably why it hasn't happened, they probably would not touch this because, you know, there's conservative, obviously, you know, wanting to buy by regulations, et cetera, hens and hers being a scrappy startup, but pretty large at this point says we'll, we'll go find a way and make it work. And so I think that is as much a case study, you know, for our clients as it is in terms of the implications of um, Ozempic. Yeah, that's such a great point, Druid. Like, just the marketing, like the customer acquisition costs that they will save, get out of like just offering this drug at this price. I mean, it's that part alone is brilliant. I hadn't even thought about that part, but you're so, so right. Chris, I'm going to go to you last on this one. Walmart was saying that there's already seen decreases yeah. in revenue because of the Ozempic drug when it came out months ago. Um, where do you land on this? Yeah, I think this story's got a lot of angles. And I love the point Truett made. Like, it's yes. actually just good retailing at the end of the yes. day. It's great retailing by him and hers. Like, you know, it makes me wonder, like, why can't Walgreens or CVS do something similar? Do they have the ability to do this? I have no idea what the regulations are, but I have to at least ask that question. And Hims is, is such a great marketer. And I mean, on Facebook every day, I get so many 
like ads. I don't want to know. Help. Chewable oh, I don't want to. I don't want to know. <laughs> no, I get so many ads, ads for chewable for ED drugs, and I go like, "How do they know so much about me? How do they know that I like gum so much?" And it's crazy. There's HIPAA but regulations that are crazy. being broken right now, Chris. <laughs> I, I just can chew gum all day long, Ed. But anyway, so but the point. I, but the other point about the story that I love is that is that it really it, there's a there's a confluence of streams starting to emerge here that could impact those that sell food. Like you talk about the risk of deflation at some point, which who knows, but it could happen. You've got population growth potentially in certain parts of the country going against you. And then now you have this as well. So Truett brought up Truett brought up generative AI. I think that's a really interesting point too, for another reason. Like if I'm a food retailer and if I'm in the boardroom, I'd be looking at one alternative sources of revenue. I'd be diving hard into marketplaces, retail media, if you think those things are applicable to you. And then the other thing I would be doing, the second thing I'd be doing is I'd be looking really hard at how do I get more productive with AI and particularly generative AI to take costs out of my business. And I do it fast because I think if you look to the future, you get that looking glass, like it, the crystal ball, so to speak, that is, you're going to have a lot of bullets pointed against you here in the next few years, potentially. Well, I love that. We, I know that I fought for that that last headline, Chris, but I think we got some really good conversation coming out of it. Some uh, great things for our audience to think about. So send us a note. Let us know what you all think as well. Um, let's move on to the lightning round. First question goes to you, Truett. Uh, the latest TikTok trend is also my worst nightmare. People are having birthday parties at Costco. Truett, if you were to have your birthday party in the food court at Costco, which staple would you make sure is included? Um, I, I would have to, I mean, it's Costco. I would have to go with the hot dog. What? So. <laughs> oh, God. What about the pizza? The Sundays? I, There's I mean, so many I don't, more things. The not, churros. Not often do I eat a hot dog. It's not on, <laughs> you know, my personal menu. It is for my kids. But uh, if I'm going to have one, it might as well be there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Ugh. Uh, All right, Jeremy, since, since you're a foodie, so Long John Silver's launched a new loyalty program. It is calling its, quote, Secret Society with secret spelled S-E-A-C-R-E-T. Jeremy, when was the last time you dined at Long John Silver's? And when you did, were you more partial to the fish or the chicken? Because my biased opinion is that Long John Silver's has the single best chicken sandwich in the marketplace. Yeah, that, that's a hot take, Chris. Uh, I, have, I have to say... <laughs> I, I don't think I've ever eaten at a Long John Silver's. What? Yeah. I haven't I'm not either. Against it. I haven't what? Either. I never, yeah. I never no. walked past a McDonald's and a Wendy's and said, I'll choose the Long John's. It just hasn't happened. <laughs> I'll choose the Long John's. Quarter of the show. Quarter of the show. Yeah. yeah but you... hey, when, when in Rome, like they do fish, I'm, I'm going to have the fish. Wow. Wow. I think you got to be a, of a certain age because Long John Silver's was dominant in the 70s and early 80s. But man. All yeah. right, let's go to let's go to headline number three. Uh, Jeremy, this one is for you as well. AM's finest Chad Lusk recently spoke at the Sweets and Snacks Expo and may have sampled one of the following quote, top five attention grabbing snacks, end quote. Which one of these are you most keen to try for yourself? Sustainable fish jerky, ramen flavored popcorn, max highly caffeinated gum. There's your gum, Chris. Uh, brain smack sour candies or pickle with chamoy candy paste. Wow. You know, I'm not even a hundred percent sure what the last one is, but I think that's the one that I try just, just for the mystery of it. Because just, just to, to check it out. out. I've yeah, never had a candy I just, I just need paste. to know. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not, I don't know what I'll that look is. that up after see what that actually is. Ask Chad. Maybe he tried it. Yeah, right. Yeah, that's right. Ask Chad. Yeah, I don't know what five of the seven words are in that last <laughs> one. <laughs> Same. <laughs> All right, true. Last one. McDonald's is inviting its customers to celebrate their grandmothers with a new Grandma McFlurry, which includes syrup and chopped candy pieces blended with vanilla soft serve ice cream. True. What is the worst candy you ever ate out of the bottom of your grandparents' bag or purse? So. I have no idea why this was the first one, but it popped in my head as a tissy roll. And the oh. reason I don't know why is, you know, what's the use case for eat, having tissy rolls in your in the purse in general? Like besides Halloween, who eats tissy rolls? And then they also they just fall out of the wrapper easily. 
So I think that's why it was at the bottom. And then, but they're also very <laughs> sticky. So it would like pick up lint and other, yeah. you know, ancillary ancillary <laughs> items on top of it. But that is literally the first thing that popped in my head was the Tootsie Roll. Oh, that is such lint. a great great receipts, answer to it cvs receipts i mean whatever there's gonna be all kinds of stuff on those in from the receipts yeah. yeah oh my god what a great one to close on well done to it happy birthday today to naomi camel morrissey even though i can't name a single one of his songs and to the woman who put the lotion in the basket the great brooke smith Remember, if you can only read or listen to one retail blog in the business, make it Avi Talk, the only retail media outlet run by two former executives from a current top 10 U.S. retailer. Our Fast Five podcast is the quickest, fastest rundown of all the week's top news. And our daily newsletter, The Retail Daily Minute, tells you all you need to know each day to stay on top of your game as a retail executive and also features regularly content that we do special for you and that is exclusive to us and that Ann and I take a ton of pride in doing. Thanks as always for listening in. Please remember to like and leave us a review wherever you happen to listen to your podcast or on YouTube. You can follow us today by simply going to youtube.com slash Omnitalk Retail. it. if people want to get in touch with the a m Consumer and Retail Group, pick your brains, get your consultative experience, what's the best way for them to do that? Yeah, we would love to connect with you. Uh, two two ways. We're uh, Jeremy and I are on LinkedIn. Also, our Alvarez and Marcel Consumer and Retail Group. We have a group page on LinkedIn. Um, secondly, you can check out our website website, which is Alvarez and Marcel CRG dot com. We love to hear from you. Awesome, awesome. Well, on behalf of Jeremy and Truett, thank you both for being here. On behalf of our friends at the A M Consumer and Retail Group, thanks for their continued sponsorship and support of our work and on behalf of all of us at OmniTalk Retail as always be careful out there OmniTalk's Retail Fast 5 is brought to you in association with the AM Consumer and Retail Group the AM Consumer and Retail Group is a management consulting firm that tackles the most complex challenges and advances its clients people and communities toward their maximum potential CRG brings the experience, tools, and operator-like pragmatism to help retailers and consumer products companies be on the right side of disruption. And Avalara. Avalara makes tax compliance faster, easier, more accurate, and more reliable for 30,000-plus business and government customers in over 90 countries. Avalara leverages 1,200-plus signed partner integrations to power tax calculations, document management, tax return filing, and tax content access. Visit avalara.com to improve your compliance journey. And Williot. Williot's ambient IoT visibility platform powered by battery-free Bluetooth tags eliminates scanning for real-time end-to-end inventory visibility. For more information, head to williot.com slash Omnitalk. And Miracle. Miracle is the global leader in platform business innovation for e-commerce. Companies like Macy's, Nordstrom, and Kroger use Miracle to build disruptive growth and profitability through marketplace, dropship, and retail media. For more information, visit miracle.com. That's M-I-R-A-K-L.com. And finally, Sezzle. Sezzle is an innovative buy now, pay later solution that allows shoppers to split purchases into four industry payments over six weeks. To learn more, visit sezzle.com.